Hey everybody, this is Captain Kyle. I'm here with a special review of the Transformers Netflix series. Transformers War for Cybertron Trilogy Siege. That is a long title. We used to have a show which was just called The Transformers. There was even Beast Wars. Transformers Animated even wasn't so long, but now they like really long titles. But regardless of the clunky name, it was a hell of a show. Now here is my non-spoiler review. It was good! That's pretty much uh, what I have to say non-spoilery. Not great, but good. I would even say very good. But that's my non-spoiler review. The rest of this review, there's gonna be some spoilers. Go watch it, come back, we'll wait. All right, let's talk about the characters. Now, some of the characters were exactly who we thought they'd be. Wheeljack, it's pretty much Wheeljack. Ironhide, we didn't see a lot of him, but he was pretty much Ironhide and Prime was the, I am the leader and I have the burden and all that stuff. Some people were not what we expected, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, Mirage has always been someone who wasn't all that keen on being in the conflict. He wasn't disloyal, but he'd rather be hunting turbo foxes. This Mirage seemed a little bit more gung-ho all about the cause. We had Red Alert as a medic instead of head of security. It just seemed that the characters were made a little bit differently. And again, not a bad thing. Bumblebee was more of a survivalist, almost like, and I hate to say it, I'm gonna get flack for this, Wheelie. Wheelie from Transformers the movie. His function was survivalist. Luckily, Bumblebee doesn't rhyme in annoying ways, but you know, he was more out for himself. And that was very different from G1, where he's like, oh Prime, I wanna be just like you. It was cool to see him more of a bitter, I don't wanna have anything to do with the Autobots type character. However, I'd have to say that there was not a lot of lighthearted characters. This was not made for kids. Everyone was pretty much dark and grim. Now, the voice acting, a lot of it was good. I felt a lot of the voices were very similar, like gravelly war-torn veteran over here. And then this person's also like, well, I'm a veteran too. Well, I think we should do that. They, there weren't a lot of distinctive voices. We had Optimus's voice was pretty distinctive. Megatron's was very distinctive. Um, and of course, Starscream, whoever did Starscream hit that out of the park. But a lot of the voices were not that distinctive. I couldn't do like a Prowl impression. I couldn't do one before, but I can't even think of how Prowl sounded. The original G1 cast had such a variety of voices that it was very easy to pick out who was who. Here, you could be listening to it. You're not necessarily gonna know which characters are which characters, except for like Soundwave, who they definitely tried to do the Frank Welker with the echoey type voice, but I don't know that it worked that well, but it was Soundwave and I was glad to see him. A lot of the characters, Impactor hasn't been seen in really the cartoons before. He was originally an Autobot who was a wrecker from the UK comics, and he had a major part to play in this particular storyline. But it was kind of sad that he didn't start out as an Autobot because there was a storyline where he was an Autobot and became later on a Decepticon. So he was con all the way, but he wasn't blindly loyal, which was kind of a good thing. Starscream, of course, very ambitious. Shockwave, he was kind of a mix of his comic book evil genius, but throw in the loyalty from the cartoon series and that was Shockwave. I mean, not every character was that developed. We can't really tell what's going on. Cog played a major part and we don't really see him <laughs> in the original G1 cartoon. So that was a new character to play with. So let's talk about the animation. It was definitely this CGI, very similar, but much more advanced from what we saw in Beast Wars and even Transformers Prime. The one thing I didn't understand in the intro, why did Cybertron look like COVID-19? That just seemed weird. But the battles were really cool and the figures definitely spot on to what actually they sold us in stores. So one thing a lot of people noticed about this show is that a lot of the bots were the same. You had tons of seekers, tons of reflectors, not refractors, tons of cogs. And I thought that was cool. Some people thought it was overused, but CGI costs a lot of money 
And when you think about it, if you have a design that works, why wouldn't you use it? However, some people are like, well, how come there weren't like multiples of Optimus Prime and multiples of Megatron or Ultra Magnus? Here's the way I figure. These guys are like Fords, Chevys, Hondas. You're just gonna see a lot of these. When it gets to like Optimus and Megatron, these are your Bentleys, your Lamborghinis. You're not gonna see as many of them. There's gonna be other ones out there, but not nearly as many as on the road as these other models that are a little more common. Though another theory is Alpha Trion supposedly had these guys, worked with them in the past, and they never really specified, but I think it was Quintessons. And they might have gotten damaged and rebuilt by Alpha Trion, so now they're custom. So you're not gonna exactly see a lot of these particular models. Those are a couple theories. But I think that recolors rock. So I don't mind if they had all these characters. And the animation is expensive. All right, the story. It moved pretty quickly. There were some pacing issues, like Seekers at the very beginning find Wheeljack and Bumblebee, and they're like, we should do something about them, and it takes them like half an hour to decide what to do. They took their time way too much. A lot of talking. But still, overall, the story I thought was good. It was kind of like, and this has been described by other people, it's kind of like if you took the first couple minutes of More Than Meets the Eye, episode one of G1, and expanded it out and showed all the backstory there, plus threw in a little bit of the Search for Alpha Trion flashbacks, you'd have Transformers Siege. But I love the fact that they did some nods to other Transformer properties, particularly um, Cybertron with the reference to Velocitron. They did have characters who seemed more like their Prime counterparts than their G1 counterparts, but it was still very heavily based in G1. I do wish they would have explained a little bit more about Alpha Trion and the fight that they had joined together in. I'm pretty sure what they're referring to is the enslavement of Cybertron by the Quintessons and getting their liberation. But it would have been nice for them to say something a little bit more along those lines. Didn't have to be like a half an hour special on talking about this is the background, but just, you know, Megatron, you're acting just like the Quintessons. And they had this treaty that Optimus wouldn't sign with Megatron. What was in the treaty? I mean, I figure Megatron's treaty wouldn't be the best, but what exactly was Optimus not happy about? But I do like the fact that the, as any good villain doesn't consider themselves a villain, Megatron and the Decepticons felt like they were oppressed, that they were in gladiatorial combat, that they were working in mines, that they were doing all this while the Autobots were just like, oh, we're going to just chill out and have some intellectual pursuits. It was a very interesting dynamic to see that the Decepticons had some definite grievances that the Autobots were probably ignoring. I was a little shocked at how many characters they killed off, like Ultra Magnus died in the first series. That was not expected. And a lot of people are like, why do they die so easily? Like Impactor died and he got hit by like one shot from a Seeker, but Cog had like, sorry Mirage, Cog had like part of his chest like blown away and he still was able to be rebuilt. I think it might be what was destroyed is the thing. I mean, the human body, if you get shot, which I've not been shot, I imagine it's not a pleasant experience, but if you get shot, you can get shot in such a way that it's not going to kill you. You can get shot, they can remove the bullet. You could even get shot in the chest and it could miss your heart. You'd have to go get some medical treatment. But if someone shot you, directly in the heart, obviously you're a goner. So that's kind of how I justify how Impactor died from that one shot. It just hit him right into his power core and basically destroyed his ability to continue functioning. The Alpha Trion protocols were something brand new. Some people were like, what the heck is this? But it was kind of nice to see something expanded upon. We had the All Spark. We had the Matrix of Leadership. The Alpha Trion pro protocols are something that haven't been seen before. So it's kind of neat that the Matrix is the power, the protocols is the knowledge, 
and they decided not to have one person have those together. But then it got wiped out, which kind of sucks. I found it interesting. Megatron was advised by Soundwave if they released this virus that would wipe out Autobot code, including the Alpha Trion protocols, that this would cause hardship for Decepticons because a lot of the computers they used also still had Autobot code in them and Megatron didn't care. He did not give one shit about what was gonna happen to the Decepticons by wiping out all the Autobot code. He just totally ignored what Soundwave was saying, which shows his level of obsession at this point that he doesn't care about the collateral damage. He wants to win and wipe out all the Autobots. He just doesn't care what happens in the meantime. As long as at the end of the day, he's triumphant over the Autobots and Optimus Prime. It's good by him. Now, I'm not gonna go through the entire show. It was very cool to see the Guardians, though. I have to say that was a nice nod again to G1. Oh my God, seeing Omega Supreme at the end was really, really cool. Was he in scale? Maybe not. I couldn't necessarily see him as someone who would fight on an equal level against Devastator. I think Devastator would be like minuscule next to that particular Omega Supreme. But it was very cool to see him, even though it was for a short time. A lot of people are like, why did he come out of the ground? Are there tunnels that big that he can go through? Didn't make a ton of sense. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. And there were some characters we didn't see at all. Springer, where the heck was he? We saw Astro Train for like half a second. He just showed up and looked very Astro Train-ish. I don't know. They couldn't get to everybody. It was cool to see Sound Blaster as not a reincarnated Soundwave as he was in the Headmaster cartoon. I will say that the goodbye scene between Optimus and Alita One, that was pulled right practically from the search for Alpha Trion, the original Transformers G1 cartoon episode. That's pretty much how they split up and decided to go their separate ways. Similar, not exactly, but it was a nice nod again to the original source material. I don't know why when the arc went through the space bridge and then there was a blinding flash and now they think they're dead. Whoa, the ship is gone. It went into a transporter. Why would you automatically think that they were dead? They're probably transported somewhere. And it's gonna be really cool to see what unidentified vessel the arc is detecting. It was a cool ending and definitely leaves you wanting more. But again, I don't know why they're like automatically assuming, well, they all died. That sucked. That just seems a little too pessimistic. Now, as you can see, I have a bunch of the Siege toys and they're very cool. And like I said, with the animation, they stuck very closely to the actual toys. So that's kind of cool. They did kind of do a Star Wars on us. So they had this great Netflix exclusive Decepticon Mirage. Very cool looking character, but it's kind of like in Star Wars where you see an alien off in the corner of the cantina for about 13 seconds and they make an action figure out of him. That's about how long this version of Mirage was on the screen was about 13 seconds and they made a figure out of him. So good going Hasbro, you're definitely continuing the Star Wars type tradition. But a lot of the toys are cool. They are coming out with new Walmart exclusives for the Netflix show. If you haven't watched this series already, then I've spoiled a shitload of stuff for you and I'm sorry. Go watch it now or rewatch it. What are your opinions of this show? Tell me what you think in the comments below. In the meantime, you'll probably want to check out our other channel, Toy Spotlight, where I have all kinds of Transformer toy reviews and knockoff reviews. If you're a big fan of this toy line, then Toy Spotlight is for you. There's a link down there to get there. You can also subscribe right down there. Hit that notification bell. Here's some other videos that we have about some other Transformers. We'll see you next time. And as always, have fun and follow your fandoms.